Hello, uh, my name is Laurent Arnaud. I'm a professor of rheumatology in uh, Strasbourg University Hospital. And I would like to say thank you very much to the IRN Riconet, to Stefano Bombardieri and Martin Mosca for the very kind invitation to come and talk about uh, drug-induced lupus. So these are my disclaimers. So we're going to talk about the classification of drug-induced SLE, about the epidemiology, clinical and laboratory patterns, then I'm going to give you a small overview about the list of drugs that are involved, just a word about the pathogenesis, and we're going to talk about the treatment. So let's start by the nosology of a deal. So I'm sure you're aware that most cases of uh, systemic lupus are actually spontaneous cases. They can be cutaneous lupus or systemic lupus, but they appear uh, spontaneously. We know that the pathogenesis is actually very complex and involves a combination of genetic factors, hormones, and also the environment, which includes the UV, but also some drugs. Everything started in 1945 with this case, a 19-year-old soldier that was actually treated for a minor skin infection using sulfadiazine. And a few months later, he experienced signs of systemic lupus, including a rash, proteinuria, and fever. In 1953, uh, other cases were reported using hydralyzine, five cases of patients showing signs of systemic lupus, and in 1962, a typical procainamid induced uh, lupus erythematosus cases. So since these uh, early times, more than 70 drugs have been reported and have been associated with systemic lupus, and it actually created a new subset, a new classification, drug-induced lupus, which can be limited to the skin or can exist as a systemic form. The epidemiology is not well known, but it is said to be up to 10 to 12% of all lupus cases, which I am not sure I actually believe. I think for systemic lupus, it's probably less. So let's review together the definition of DEAL. DEAL is suspected in patients who will show signs of systemic lupus, uh, I think a combination of both clinical, laboratory and immunology features is important. The patient should not have any element that is suggestive of systemic lupus before treatment onset. There should be sufficient exposure to the drug, we will come back to that, but usually it's a few months. The pattern, clinical patterns and autoantibody should disappear after discontinuation of the drug, but it takes several weeks to several years, coming back to that in a minute. And sometimes, if we have the opportunity or the un unluck to do that, uh, there can be a positive re-challenge test. I think the main difference between SLE and DEAL is actually the resolution of the symptoms after the discontinuation of the suspected medication. You see that in the case of DEAL, the manifestations will disappear using a few uh, weeks or years after the stop while they will continue in the case of typical SLE. DEAL is not allergy. There are some shared manifestations such as the reversal after withdrawal or the use of corticosteroids, but allergy is an immediate reaction mediated by IgE while DEAL is delayed and the mechanisms are very different. DEAL should also be distinguished for, from other idiosyncratic reactions. You can have hemolytic anemia, thrombocytopenia, leukopenia, or even serum sickness, and they are mediated for different mechanisms. So let's talk about the epidemiology of DEAL. Uh, in the context of SLE, we know that there's a strong female predominance, and uh, usually the patients are aged 20 to 40 year old. In the case of DEAL, there is still a female predominance, but it is less clear, and the age of the beginning of the manifestations are actually is influenced by the type of drug that, are, that is being used. Let's review the clinical and autoantibody profile. Something almost common to all cases of DEAL is the presence of constitutional manifestations such as malaise, fatigue, and fever. There is also very common arthralgia, sometimes, rarely, arthritis and myalgia. The other manifestations are really depending on the type of drug that is responsible. What I can tell you is that photosensitivity, mucosal involvement, alopecia and malo rash is actually not common in DIL and is usually evocative of SLE. 
Regarding the laboratory manifestations, the cytopenia are actually quite rare. And a key message is that low complement is very rare in deal, why it is observed in about 50% of cases of spontaneous SLE. I think something very striking are the immunologic manifestations. Virtually all patients will have positive antinuclear antibodies. Something you will find in all the books is the strong positivity of anti-stone antibodies. But I would like to tell you that this is also the case in systemic lupus, in about 60% of cases. So by themselves, the presence of uh, anti-stone antibodies are not sufficient to distinguish DIL from systemic lupus. A key feature is that anti-double-stranded DNA are actually rarely positive in DIL. So that's an important difference with systemic lupus. There are a few exceptions. I come back to that at the end of the talk. This is especially the case for a TNF-alpha-induced drug-induced lupus, for which there's very often a positivity for anti-double-stranded DNA. Just a little word about the anchors. In some cases, P anchors can actually be positive in DIL. This is the case for uh, minocycline-induced DIL cases. These are the uh, yet unpublished uh, new criteria, EULA ACR criteria for systemic lupus. And you can see that most patients with DIL, if they have antinuclear antibodies, fever and synovitis, or at least arthralgia, do not meet the classification criteria for SLE. Now the heart of the presentation, the list of the drugs. Well, there are two different lists of drugs. One is for cutaneous only drug-induced lupus. On this slide, you really have the list. Most patients will have positive antinuclear antibodies and they will have positive anti-SSA antibodies in a huge majority of cases. The drugs I have to quote from these slides are triazid uh, diuretics, calcium blockers, antifungal therapies such as turbinafine, and pot, uh, proton pump inhibitors such as omeprazole or, or anti-TNF. This is very typical drugs that are inducing cutaneous deal. Regarding systemic lupus inducing drugs, it's a bit different. Uh, I mentioned this earlier, there are more than 70 drugs that are responsible. Um, but for most of them, we only have data from case reports. Uh, if you want to find the drugs that have been reported, such as um, case control studies, they are less common and they include minocycline, hydralazine, carbamazepine, the statins, isoniazid, and also, and of course, the anti-TNF. I'd like to stay just a few minutes on this uh, induction of systemic lupus using anti-TNF because I think this is com something quite uh, common and that should be known by rheumatologists and internists that manage uh, patients with rheumatoid arthritis. The appearance of anti-nuclear antibodies during uh, anti-TNF alpha treatment is actually quite common. It is observed in up to 30% of the patients. About 10% of the patients will develop anti-double-stranded DNA antibodies, but this is just immunity. Only a minority of the patients will develop drug-induced systemic lupus. There is a strong association, but still it is very rare in less than 1% of the cases. And we actually have good data uh, from France about that. The occurrence with infleximab occurs of deal, full-blown cases, in less than 0.2% of cases, and this is the same with etanercept. So I'd like to really underline the difference between the classical um, anti-TNF-alpha-induced uh, uh, deal and classical deal. Uh, if you take classical deal, the prevalence of anti-double-stranded DNA is very low, less than 5%. And you can see on the slide that with uh, anti-TNF-alpha, the positivity is much more common. So this is kind of exception with uh, the cases of DIL. Also, hypocomplementemia is rare in DIL, but quite common in the DIL cases induced by anti-TNF-alpha uh, uh, blockers. This is the same for skin manifestations, not commune, not common with DIL, but more common when it's induced by anti-TNF. Just a word about two common cases, something which is a bit hot in uh, 2019, uh, which are checkpoint inhibitors. I had the opportunity to review uh, a series of 86 cases of arthritis uh, uh, due to uh, checkpoint inhibitors. 
and you can see that a small proportion of these cases are actually systemic lupus or cutaneous lupus being induced by checkpoint inhibitors. A word of advice regarding the vaccines, you know that there are very controversial data in the literature. The French uh, government, French health ministry, uh, led this uh, very interesting study following up young women uh, who were vaccinating against APV, HPV, and we recorded um, no significant associations with the induction of systemic lupus. What is very striking is that the drugs that have been quoted, especially those that are the most associated with deals, are actually very old drugs. Uh, if you take procainamide, which is the strongest association with deal, more than 50% of deal cases after one year, uh, actually this drug has been discontinued in most countries. Uh, I really had to, to search to find at least one manufacturer that still produces procainamide. And you can see in the, the little paper, in the little booklet inside the, the, the tablets, that there is a warning about cases of lupus. The prolonged administration of procainamide may lead to the development of positive antinuclear antibodies with or without symptoms of lupus-like. So I think this is an important uh, message. What is very striking is that now we are in 2019, so the landscape of deal must have evolved. And actually, with my team, I had the opportunity to search a database from the World Health Organization called um, VigiBase, which covers 90% of the wealth of the world uh, population. And we were actually able to extract cases of deal from this database. So I think I mentioned briefly that most cases of deal have been reported in case report or small series. And using this methodology, we were able to extract more than 12,000 cases of deal. So this is really what I would call the, a big data open science study. So this is the list of drugs that we found significantly associated with deal. And uh, well, you may refer to this publication in ARD if you want to have the detailed list and the, the detail about the strength of the association. Just a word about the results of this study. The median age of the patients was less than 50 year old, and you can see that 25% of cases occurred before 35 years of age. The sex ratio was 4.3, so still a strong female predominance, less than in systemic lupus, spontaneous systemic lupus, but still a strong female predominance. Something which I think is very interesting is the median delay, six months. Then the strongest association was found with procainamide and hydrolazine. I think this is very interesting because these are the two drugs that are the most well known to be associated with DEAL, so they serve as internal controls, and the majority of cases we found, 30% of the total of deal cases, were actually due to anti-TNF-alpha blockers. So what I can tell you is that we, we were able to study the uh, chronological variation in the cases of deal, and in the most recent peri period, the most common providers of deals are actually uh, anti-TNF-alpha blockers. So uh, I underlined for you in this uh, red rectangle what I think are the drugs all rheumatologists should know almost by heart that are really responsible for deal and still used nowadays. Just a word about pathogenesis. Uh, one hypothesis, what well, there could be a link with uh, HLA. Uh, well, this is true for some drugs, but there is no common HLA that is shared between all the drugs that induce deals. So this is just a minor risk factor. Another question that was asked in the literature is, is there a common chemical structure? Well, this is true for some drugs, such as aromatic amines or hydrazines, but what you can see on this slide is that drug that induced deals are actually found across many different uh, pharmacological groups, and so there is not only one single chemical structure. Most studies point out that it must be something around the cytotoxicity of the metabolite, especially involving the detoxification pathway and the pharmacogenetics, but we have to work more about that. One example, for instance, is the slow acetylator pattern that is a very strong risk factor for procainamide-induced deal. Let's talk about the treatment. I think you have understood that because this is due to a drug, the best treatment is actually to stop the drug. Then we have to wait for the signs to disappear, and this can take several weeks, so in between we can use a short course of corticosteroids or use a bit of hydroxychloroquine if needed. 
What is a strong difference between DEAL and SLE is that in DEAL the clinical and laboratory manifestations will disappear within weeks. The autoimmunity, on the other hand, will take quite a long time to disappear, usually up to at least one year. The prognosis of DEAL is usually favorable because these are moderately severe cases, but occasionally there have been some very severe cases being reported, including cases leading to death. This uh, last slide recapitulates all the clinical laboratory immunologic differences, treatment pattern and evolution between SLE and, and DEAL. I just wanted to underline that there are continuous changes in the pharmacopoeia, so we should definitely monitor new drug for a potential inducing a DEAL pattern. The epidemiology of DEAL is very different from that of SLE, but the best way to think about DEAL is actually to review all the drugs that are being prescribed by looking at the prescription and checking whether some drugs could be uh, associated with DEAL. Currently, the patterns have changed a lot, but the majority of cases of DEAL are induced by NTTNF. With this, I would like to say thank you very much.